Cool. Uh, so, hi, my name is Roman. Um, I work at Netflix in the machine learning infrastructure team. Uh, and uh, I'm here today to talk to you guys about how uh, we deploy uh, machine models uh, as microservices or how we help data scientists deploy such models uh, at Netflix. Uh, okay. So, to start, um, when you think machine learning at Netflix, you're probably thinking, well, your title page. Uh, so the layout of the page, the rows, um, what gets shown in each rows, the title art for each title that gets picked, all that. And yes, that is all uh, machine learning and that's all uh, what we call personalization. And that definitely happens and we do a lot of it. Uh, this has happened for a really long time for you guys old enough like me to remember the Netflix prize. Uh, this is what it was about where Netflix would uh, or paid a million dollars to people who could design a better algorithm than they, than they did at the time. Um, so yeah, that's all ML, but that's not everything that ML is used for at Netflix. Uh, we use it a lot in business critical applications that are not necessarily user facing, but so that you don't necessarily see uh, when you go to the Netflix page. Uh, so we use ML to inform a lot of business decisions around user churn, um, genres that people are interested in, um, the value of the content, so how much we should be paying for a particular content, um, production schedules, release dates, a whole bunch of things like that, uh, better targeting for marketing campaigns, all that uses ML. Um, it's quite important because, as you may know, Netflix spends upwards of $12 billion a year on content and uh, other production costs. So being able to do that in a more rational manner is very, very helpful for Netflix. So that's what this talk is about. It's about how we deploy um, these models internally. So not how we do personalization, that's a completely separate organization. So my team uh, is focused on the machine models that are used in these other categories. So how may that work? Um, how does one of these models get used, or how is one of these cases? So well, say you have an executive, Reed in this case, so everyone knows him, uh, he has a question about something that ML can inform him on. So like, for example, he wants to know the predicted number of users that will watch a particular show within when it's released uh, initially. So what will probably happen is he'll, you know, input this information into some sort of UI, and uh, pardon my artistic work, uh, my daughter's four and she draws a lot and I thought I would give it a try. I'm probably less successful than she is, but uh, that's my attempt anyway. So. Reed goes to a UI and puts the title to a movie, and you know this will go in some backend somewhere. Uh, it's hosted on a server. Get some data about the model, get the input from Reed, and um, you know, process the uh, request and return uh, the result back. Uh, importantly, here this is something that's real time. It's not a batch processing result that he's interested in. He wants to give it some data. In this case, the title, but it can be something a little bit more complicated get some other data or some training data that has already been produced uh, and return a result. And we want to keep track of this. We want to figure out you know, what the request was uh, and what the response was so that if, for example, later on Reed figures out that he was misled uh, by this model, we can actually go back and improve the model. So uh, this can all be done today. So. Um, if you're not familiar with these terms, it's okay. It's not important for the rest of the talk, but just if you are, uh, you can have a Flask app in the front. Uh, we use S3 as data storage at uh, Netflix, so you have uh, your data somewhere living in S3. You can have the, your logs uh, in Kibana. So a whole bunch of stuff that all this can work today. Um, so my talk is about describing how we do this better at Netflix or how we do this more efficiently. So just to recap a little bit, uh, after your uh, data extraction and training, the two use cases that I covered for um, the models are the one, the recommendations, so the one that you're all familiar with, the business use cases, and um, just for completeness sakes, there's two other use cases that uh, occur fairly frequently at Netflix. Uh, one is batch processing, which you're all familiar with, and then the other one is some sort of a unicorn use case where data scientists are just interested in figuring out, you know, trying out a particular model, so it's a single use model kind of thing. Um, all these use cases have extremely different usage characteristics and that's what makes them interesting. The first one, um, very high SLA, clearly when you get to your web, uh, your page on Netflix or your app or wherever, we want your recommendations to come out really, really quickly. 
Otherwise, it's a bad user experience. Bad user experience means less revenue, bad things happen. So very high QPS, very uh, strict SLA um, for the first use case. Second use case, batch processing, those are kind of background processes. We don't really care when it happens, we just want them to happen at some point. There's very little differentiating logic into what happens in a batch process. Usually you just have things, something to run and you just kind of run it whenever there's time. Third use case, quick experimentation. We really want people to be able to try out different models. We want people to be able to, you know, be productive basically. Uh, but there's no real SLA. This is kind of a one use case. So people just want to try their model, get results and move on to something else. And the last case that I had described earlier, it's very important that it works. It doesn't have the same SLA requirements as the first one because if it goes down at 3 a.m. Well, the executive who was up at that time for whatever reason can actually wait till eight in the morning to get his result and, and things won't break. Um, low QPS, um, not that many requests, but they're important ones. So we actually want to make sure that they're treated okay. So who deploys these models is basically the question. Um, in the first two cases, it kind of makes sense that the uh, engineer does it. Um, for the first case, it's kind of obvious, uh, given that there's such a high performance requirement, uh, engineers are the ones that are most apt at knowing how the systems work. So they have to work in collaborations with data scientists so that they can deploy these services the most, in the most effective way. The batch processing, the engineers can also be involved. There's, very, like I said, there's very little differentiating logic, so it doesn't. The data scientist doesn't really have any input to bring here. The next two cases are the interesting ones. So should it be the data scientist or the engineers that are in charge of those use cases? So, well, let's think about it. Um, there's three ways of going about this, pretty much. The first way is to collaboratively deploy it, which is kind of what the recommendation system is. So you have both the engineers and the data scientists that uh, deploy this. Um, there's a problem with this. Um, on the left, yeah, your left, uh, you'll have what the engineer kind of talks about, so the kind of low level or lower level concepts. And on the right, Data scientist isn't really interested in anything on the left. He's more interested in code logic, you know, how uh, the requests get logged and how they can see their results and things like that. So you kind of get this. Uh, and actually, it was kind of funny because on Monday, yes, uh, yesterday, Lauren gave this talk and there was this slide uh, in it where um, it's a little, sorry, this is a picture I took of the slide. Um, so it's a little hazy. But it says that the interaction between Lauren or her team and the IT or data of uh, the engineer basically is uh, when access is needed or a project moves from modeling to deployment, only IT can get it done. And you have the you know communicate timeline needs in writing as much notice as possible. So you can see here that interactions between uh, you know engineers and data scientists aren't always great because the engineers are overloaded, the data scientist wants to get their work done, so everyone kind of gets, becomes frustrated out of this uh, relationship. Um, and, you know, everyone has the best of intentions, but this is kind of what happens. So, okay, so that's not great. Um, we could potentially ask the engineer to also deploy the service. Okay, so let's say David, the engineer here, happy guy, um, a data scientist comes around and says, oh, I have my model, I have my data. <laughs> Sorry, I told you my artwork wasn't awesome, but you know. Uh, and here's the results that I want to kind of produce. So David comes along and, and helps um, the data scientist. And that kind of works okay. And then another data scientist comes along um, and David's starting to feel a little bit more pressure here. Um, on our team, we're six people and we have 100 plus data scientists and they're very productive. Um, so you quickly get into this situation. <laughs> and at this point, Dave is not feeling so hot. Uh, so it becomes really unmanageable really quickly. So not great. Okay, so that doesn't work either. So okay, now we can ask the data scientist to do it. And it's like, okay, engineer's happy because it um, doesn't have to deal with 100 plus data scientists and their models. So Carrie wants to basically write a function that says, oh, I want to do something in my service. So, okay, so Carrie starts writing her function. Everything's good. And then she's told by, you know, the engineers, well, you need to deploy it to some server that has a REST API. And so, you know, okay, so Carrie's like, okay, fine. I try to figure this out and 
goes ahead and tries to figure this out. And then, you know, she follows along and said, okay, you know, now you need to deploy this in some server bank using something called Docker. By this point, Carrie's kind of losing interest or becoming really <laughs> sad. <laughs> and then, you know, there may be multiple blue guys over here kind of querying this. And so, you know, a load balancer and multiple instances. And then finally, Carrie says, well, but you know, I have multiple models and they might have multiple versions, and so <laughs> you get this. So Carrie's not great here either. So this is not perfect. So none of these solutions are great at Netflix. We actually want Carrie to be happy, and we want David to be happy, and we want both of them to be productive. So this is what we're trying to do, and we want to get to this solution, where Carrie, back to being happy, writes a very simple function that defines an endpoint and returns the obvious answer to every question. And something else, in this case, what I will be describing is called Metaflow, takes care of everything else underneath it. And the engineer doesn't have to be involved. Carrie can do this all on her own uh, and, and gets what she wants. So to recap, basically, we want data scientists to own deployment of their own microservices without involving engineers. And we want software engineers to provide basically this data scientist-focused path to deploy microservices. I'm not talking about Flask, JUnicorn, Docker, whatever. Something that data scientists, you know, in the world of the data scientist. So this helps the engineer increase their leverage, saves a truckload of time, and then the data scientist doesn't have to deal with the underlying intricacies, doesn't have to figure out what base version of the AMI is being used or anything like that that, you know, makes things fun for engineers like myself. So the characteristics that we're looking for in the system is we want a simple definition, simple deployment, traceable and reproducible, debuggable, and versionable. The reason for this, well, I, I kind of went over the reasoning for why simple. Um, we want it to actually be useful and used. Traceable and reproducible, I kind of touched on that earlier. Um, we want uh, a model that produces a result. We want to be able to figure out what result it produced in case the answer was incorrect or wasn't the one that was expected. And we want it to be reproducible so you can debug it later. Um, speaking of reproducibility, um, one of my colleagues for us will be giving a talk on reproducibility in uh, Metaflow this afternoon at 4.30 in this room. We want it to be debuggable, again, so the data scientist is kind of self-serve um, and can actually uh, work out any problems that come up. And versionable, um, because multiple models may be deployed, and for the same model you may have multiple training runs, and you may want to serve up the inference from all of those at the same time. And you want to kind of keep track of which is which. So as I mentioned, uh, the tool that we have at Netflix to do this is called Metaflow. And so this is what I'll be describing. Um, just to be clear, you could do this in another way. You could have other tools that do this. Uh, I'm just describing it in the context of Metaflow. So I'll give a brief primer about what Metaflow is. <clears throat> this is not... <coughs> Excuse me. It's not a full explanation of Metaflow. There's other talks online that you can find if you Google Metaflow that will give you a much more detailed view. But this is just to help you understand how it works and how it's useful in hosting. So a basic computation in data science and most other places is uh, you have some input, you do some computation, and you produce some output. And you know you can kind of view this as the very simple Python code on the right there. So Metaflow allows you to define your ML workflow in a similar way, <coughs> but we do it using a directed acyclic graph, or DAG. So this is actual code from Metaflow on the right. That's how you would write it. You would annotate your functions with this step decorator that just says that this is a step in your flow. Uh, so a little bit of terminology, we call this the entire thing, the whole DAG, a flow, a run is an instance of this flow, so it's basically an execution with a particular input set that you run. And then each node in the graph here, we call it a step, and uh, a step can potentially have multiple tasks that are associated with it. It's not visible here, but potentially you could have what we call a for each step, which has a dynamic uh, uh, element in the number of branches that are produced. Here you just have um, the step to start, a, B, join, and end. So Metaflow always has a start and an end, and then stuff in between. 
Uh, so why do we do it in DAG? Well, it has some advantages. You can see that each of these is kind of um, a process, and actually it is. Um, so each node is a separate process that can run either on the same machine or can be distributed across multiple machines very easily. So it's kind of scalable, particularly, like I said, when you have this uh, dynamic, um, when you have this dynamic for each node. And it also has uh, good properties of natural, natural checkpointing, so the state can be saved at each of these nodes. Uh, so it's well contained. Uh, it can, we do a whole bunch of nice things with that, like you can resume your flows, you can save state, you can inspect each of your steps, et cetera. So um, it's, it's pretty nice for um, a whole bunch of reasons. Um, the other nice part about it is data. So if the previous slide, so each of the step is a process, you might be wondering how data moves around between them. So suppose you have this very simple uh, data movement where you initialize x to zero initially, and then one node you increment it to three, the ne next one by two, and the last one you just take the maximum and just carry that on. So at the end of the start step, what Metaflow does under the hood and internally, and this is not something the data scientist has to worry about, the data scientist just writes self.x equals zero, what Metaflow does internally is at the end of it, <coughs> it will hash all the values that are assigned to self to, find, to compute a key. It will use that key to store that value in S3, as you can see in the little cloud on the bottom, or any of your cloud provider, or a key values provider. And, um, and then it will also record that in this particular step, so identified by the flow number, the step name, and some ID that you don't have to worry about, that X corresponds to this hash. And now when A wants to add 3 to value X, it needs to look up what the value of X was first. And so what it does is it does the reverse. It takes, um, it'll go into this map, look up the hash, or the key that X corresponds to, then fetch that value from S3, lazily load it into the process that's running, and do the computation on it, and then things go on. So at the end of A, the same thing happens. All the values are again hashed and stored. So at the end of the process, you end up with something like this, where you have the values that are stored in the cloud and some sort of mapping uh, that is kept for what a hash is present where. So the hashing allows for kind of an automatic deduplication. So here you see that we only store three values um, in the cloud. So how is this useful for hosting? Well, if you think about it, at the end of your training, everything that you've produced, all your artifacts, all your models, anything that you may want for your inference is stored in the cloud with a nice mapping, and we have all that information that we can magically provide to you uh, in your hosting. So if you remember, in the um, previous slide with Carrie, who was writing, returning the answer to the world and everything, um, now Carrie may want to return something that's actually related to her training flow, so like this one that we have here. So she would write exactly the same thing that she wants to write, so just a simple function like this. The only difference here is this automagical self.artifact.flow.x. The syntax is a little involved because I didn't get into it in this talk, but we can actually um, get artifacts from multiple flows at the same time, so that's why the syntax is a little bit more difficult than what you would expect. But the only difference from, you know, return 42 is <coughs> Now Carrie can return some more differentiated results that are based on what uh, she produced in her flow. Now this is completely done automatically by uh, Metaflow. The, you don't have to worry about where this X comes from. Um, it's just fetched from S3 uh, in the right way. And your users, so Carrie's users, uh, then just simply go to this URL or some version of it like this and they will get the result that Carrie wants. So in this case, there's no input produced, but you can, um, you can see here that there's a request dictionary which would contain any of the request information that is passed um, to Carrie's function. Okay, <clears throat> so um, a couple of other points about what uh, we do with hosting um, to address the uh, issues that we had earlier. Uh, versioning, <clears throat> so if Carrie has two versions of her code, the first one here, she would deploy, say, uh, from run zero, so this run zero, so the first run that she did, uh, you, the URL would have like a little V0, and you could just access it this way, and you would produce three. <laughs> and she runs it again and then deploys that runs. 
you'd have v1, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, so you'd have two, ur two different URLs, and it would produce the right result. So in this case, um, to emphasize, the code is the exact same one. There's no difference from the you know, return self.artifacts.flow.x. Uh, it fetches the right one. It does the right thing under the hood for you and, and, and returns the right result. Uh, we introduced another notion. So now Carrie wants the UI that we had talked about initially to uh, always return you know, the latest and greatest model. So she can have these two models. She can compare them. She can do whatever she wants. And then at some point she said, okay, I want this one to be the official one. So we have something called promotion, which basically just uh, has the basic URL without version number and then picks one of the ones, uh, the, the one that the data scientist wants. Uh, speaking of promotion, um, one common use case is that these models run multiple times, uh, and every time they run, Carrie might decide, well, I want to make sure that this deploys a new uh, version. Uh, and so we have this that you can integrate it directly in your training flow. So you run your training flow, or you have a cron job that runs your training flow, and at the end of it, you say, well, I, now I want to deploy it. So we just have this construct called hosting deployment that allows you to say what you want to deploy, to do some basic testing to make sure that your model is producing the correct results, so that's the audit statement. And at the end, you can say, okay, now it's passed everything, I will promote this. This basically um, is nice because it's completely side effect free. Uh, if, it, if it doesn't pass the test, then it will never get promoted and your users don't see that you had a worked model that, um, you know, that trained badly or something. So they'll still use the old version, but if it passes, they'll get to use this version. And again, you don't have to do anything about it. Uh, okay, so how did we do uh, with our initial um, requirements? So a simple definition, well, uh, I think, I'm hoping that all of you can agree that it's fairly straightforward. Uh, you just have to define your Python function, an endpoint, and everything else is taken care of for you. Uh, simple deployment, well, we have a CLI, so some may argue that <clears throat> that's not perfect. Uh, I like command line, but, you know, uh, not the optimal. We don't have a UI yet. You actually have to write you know, Python, your function, deploy, et cetera. Um, so you know, maybe a UI will come at some point. Uh, traceable, reproducible. Uh, all API calls are logged, uh, so it's easily redeployable as well. Uh, since we have everything in S3, we can easily take that um, whatever you had and redeploy it. So it's easy to trace and easy to reproduce. Debuggable, we do have the logs, but they're a little hard to, iter um, to find. Uh, it's, quick, it's a little bit hard to kind of iterate quickly and debug on those. That's something we can improve and we're working on. Uh, versionable, so we do have different versions that are easy, easy to parse out. And there's this notion of promotion that allows you to kind of um, isolate your users from all your versions and just give them the latest version that you want. So overall, uh, not so bad. Um, okay, in the... <coughs> Last part of my talk, I want to kind of focus a little bit about implementation. So for the data scientists in the room, this may be slightly less interesting. Uh, for the data, uh, for the software engineers, um, maybe this will give you some ideas of how you could potentially deploy something similar in your um, work. So um, <clears throat> we uh, evaluated different solutions, and I didn't put everything that we evaluated, but some of the ones that we did and some of the criteria that we uh, wanted. So we wanted basically um, this service to be um, to produce consistent results, um, to be low maintenance. Like I said, we're six people. We support 100 plus data scientists, so we don't really have time to reinvent the wheel on everything. Uh, we wanted logging tracing for the reasons that I explained earlier, and we wanted some form of load balancing. Uh, like I said, not necessarily very high QPS, but some services do have some uh, heavy load. They do a lot of computation, so we can't just have one box serving all of them. So we explored three uh, solutions. DNS redirect, which is the pretty straightforward uh, thing where you just basically tell the DNS system all your backends for a particular service. Uh, proxy, which is exactly what it is. Um, and OpenFast, which is a, a functions uh, as a service uh, framework uh, that's open source. Um, you can use other things like AWS Lambdas uh, in here as well, but um, OpenFast was a project that is um, developed already, uh, pretty mature, and um, someone was implementing it within the Netflix infrastructure so we could reuse it. So the DNS solution, um, it has really low maintenance. There's basically nothing to do. Uh, your DNS system does everything. Uh, it's not really consistent in the sense that it is dependent on the caching infrastructure. Uh, so your DNS, when you have a client that queries the DNS, 
uh, it will cache the results, and that cache can lead to some inconsistencies. And uh, if you're updating your service or you're uh, deploying a new one, you may not get the, you may not actually hit that new one right away. Um, it doesn't really have any logging or tracing by itself. DNS systems aren't designed for that. And uh, it does some load balancing uh, in the sense that you can define uh, multiple uh, backends for one URL. So it'll do that a little bit, but it's not ideal. It's kind of more random and it's dependent on the client implementation and you're not really in control of it. Proxy um, had lots of good things for, for pretty much everything except that it wasn't low maintenance. Uh, we would need to actively maintain the proxy. Uh, updated, et cetera, and um, no one was helping us for that. <clears throat> so we picked OpenFast, because like I said, someone was actually implementing it for other use cases. It's consistent since there's a single gateway. Um, it has logging and tracing, again, because of the single gateway, and it has great load balancing, or at least uh, you can implement different load balancing strategies. <clears throat> so there's two things that we actually deploy. Um, the first one is the control plane which registers the hosted service, deploys the service, it tracks promotions, and um, it also has the ability to log the query since everything is going through it. It does the redirects as well. Uh, the reason for that last one in particular is because of this notion of promotion, we have to actually look up uh, in a stateful manner what is the latest version that you want to actually hit. And then we have what the user code will run in, uh, so the hosted service, and that does all the magic, basically. Uh, it downloads the user code that is needed. It downloads all the needed artifacts, so that's that self.artifact.flow. Uh, it does any user-directed initialization. We have some, uh, some use cases that need to initialize TensorFlow, for example. And then it starts up a HTTP server um, to serve out the uh, at endpoint <coughs> functions that the user uh, provided. And then it also collects the logs uh, for debuggability. So how does it work uh, in practice? or in real life. Um, so um, for those who weren't fully aware, um, Netflix is <coughs> an AWS uh, shop. So our cloud runs in AWS. Uh, we have things like Spinnaker, which help us ma manage it. It's an open source project uh, that helps you manage your instances. And we have something called Titus, which is like a Kubernetes, um, which is our container management system. So. Um, we have this gateway, OpenFast gateway, which is what I mentioned we were using for the service. So the first thing it does is it will deploy the uh, control plane using our infrastructure. So this basically uh, deploys an AWS instance um, that runs our control plane code. This is a small code, so we don't really have too many instances of these. It's, it, it's really lightweight. And that one has a, a backing uh, database to store, like I said, the promotions and any of um, the, uh, you know, the activity or logging information that we want. So now it comes along Metaflow <coughs> that wants to deploy a service. Um, so it will call into the gateway saying, hey, I want to deploy uh, the service. Um, this will forward it to the control plane, which handles these types of requests, which will register everything into the database, um, do any housekeeping there, and then call back into the OpenFast gateway saying, create me another function, which is the actual one that I want to deploy. So that will go back to the cloud, so AWS and actually create this uh, hosted microservice uh, function. And so you can have a whole bunch of these, of course, um, that are deployed either this, uh, multiple instances of the same version or just different microservices. And now when uh, Reed comes along and wants to actually uh, do a query, he will also go and query into the OpenFast gateway, which will look which will ask the control plane, hey, what is Reed looking for? So this is where we do all the res resolution for um, the promotions, which version we're looking at. So this goes into our uh, persistent data stored to figure out what we want. Uh, returns back to the gateway saying, okay, now I know which one you should be forwarding to. <coughs> and the gateway actually forwards to the proper microservice. So that's... Um, the entire system that we have, uh, kind of at a high level. Uh, but as you can see, we rely heavily on existing services. So the part that we did ourselves in our team is basically the control plane, which is a fairly lightweight Go process or Go server. And then this hosted microservice, uh, which just does the Python magic around. Uh, so again, fairly lightweight for us. And everything else is kind of handled by someone else in our team, or in Netflix. Okay, uh, to conclude, uh, just uh, shameless plugs, multiple of them. Uh, we're hiring. 
So if you're interested, uh, that's the job link that you can go to. You can also send me an email. That's my email. Uh, you can just see us. There's a couple of other people from my team around here as well. Um, so just look for, oh, I don't know. I think I'm the only one wearing the T-shirt today. But anyway, um, just ask me. Uh, there's a, a talk this afternoon, like I said, uh, at 4.30 in this room, uh, Reproducibility and Metaflow by Faraz, who will um, talk about, uh, give you a bit more detail on Metaflow and how it, it uh, provides reproducibility for ML training. And then lastly, uh, we are actually going to open source all of this. The hosting part that I described may not be <coughs> available right away, but if you're interested, come talk to me. Uh, otherwise, um, yeah, look for it by the end of the year or just come talk to us if you want to use it before. And uh, that's it. Thank you so much. And I'll be ready for questions. Hi. Um, thank you so much. That was an awesome talk. Um, I just had a quick question. You, you mentioned that the open uh, FAS was very similar to Netflix, and it sounded like the DAG architecture was very similar to like a net, uh, or sorry, very similar to AWS Lambda. Um, um, and that has like the step functions now. So, what was Netflix's thinking for so, not um, using Lambda for that implementation? Yeah, so, um, sorry, so I, I talked about the, the Lambda as um, a rep for OpenFast, right? Um, and um, so that was for the hosting deployment. For the training part, so the DAG part, um, you can run it on a on on a, on step on step function or on batch. Actually, uh, for our open source release, uh, that will use batch uh, as one of the implementations as one of the backends. Um, the lambdas are more for the hosting side that I, I was kind of saying, and so so we it was for the basically function as a service kind of uh, implementation. Okay. But the you're right, the the DAG is uh, a, a very good fit for for batch, for example. So how um, abstracted is the user in Metaflow from managing environments and dependencies and things like that? It looks like you've completely abstracted them from like, like containerizing things and stuff like that. How does that all get pieced together? Um, yeah, the user, I mean, our goal is to make the data scientist's life easy and not have them worry about any of the stuff that you know, they're not paid to do in some, in some fashion. Um, so... The user, basically, the interface for the user is they write pure Python code and just basically what each of the node does. Uh, if you're talking about Metaflow for the training part, I'm responding for that. Uh, so they just write basically each step function and what it does, and uh, it's just pure Python code. They can use whatever they want, TensorFlow, whatever. It, we don't put any restrictions on that. Um, a lot of users do, for example, pip install at the t beginning of their step to actually get all their dependencies. We have other ways of de dealing with dependencies, and um, for us, does get into that in the afternoon talk as well. Um, but otherwise, that's pretty much at the level of abstraction that the user does. It's just that they store all their artifacts in the self variable, like I mentioned, and they just that is just available to any other step going forward. Um, I have a question about the graph, uh, not the graph, but the chart in the end um, about the process. What was the need for the repetitive process of um, the CEO going to the open pass? And then instead of going straight to the microservice he wanted, what, what was the, why, why would you have to go first to the Go server and then back? Okay, then? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, the reason is particularly to do with the, uh, the, this notion of promotion. So open fast is completely stateless uh, and we need to map you're asking for my web service, which of the versions that I have running around are the ones that, is the one that you want to get to. So that is looked up basically in this uh, database that's stored. So you have to go there, query that, and then go fetch, go fetch around. You're right that in the case where you do know the version number that you want to get, you technically don't need that loop, but it's really fast. So it, it, we, it's like we just you know, made a simple thing. And it also allows us to do URL rewriting to make it look <coughs> Uh, nicer than what the OpenFast URL allows us for. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>